could be a crack in the dam. Uh, there is myth in the Gospels. And you can't tell when you go from history to myth. And one of the examples he cites is the resurrection account where Jesus was resurrected. And then the account tells us that tombs were opened and the dead were walking around the city. So Jay had some thoughts on that that I wanted to share. It won't take long, but it gives you a different perspective to answer that, which says, yes, it actually is history, it's not myth, and it has uh, a different <coughs> event that had already happened that this expanded upon. So we'll have him do that. Jay, one, one second, one second. Uh, and then Jay, <laughs> yeah, uh, Jay has, was, and I want to get the terminology correct, one of Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> you can always tell when they were, because they always say one of Jehovah's Witnesses, not just a J-Dub or anything like that. They were one of Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> and he always has had this problem with uh, independent thinking and questioning mind. <laughs> and so he was asking questions and writing articles, and as a result, they uh, enlisted him to write for the Watchtower magazine. And so he was one of the writers. Unfortunately, he came up with this weird idea from the Bible that you should worship Jesus. And they didn't like that too much. So they asked him if he kindly would leave. I don't know how kind they were, but they did ask him to leave. And so uh, he ended up leaving. And when I met him, he was working through the, a number of theological questions. The thing I value about Jay is he is an honest searcher. And so even though I may not agree with him at one point in time, as he searches, either he or I or both end up changing our position slightly because the biblical evidence is persuasive to do that. So he values scripture highly. He is not only intellectually but emotionally engaged and his highest priority is how do I serve the master? Mm. I can't say enough about it, and what he's talking about today is an article also in our journal, which is downstairs, hot off the presses. Uh, it's down there. The lead article is uh, World Deep Boutique, but his article <coughs> on the Trinity is in there, and it's a different perspective, a different way to understand a difficult concept. So, yes? Yeah, yes. Or what? 
And uh, why do we have no other record? What happened to these people? Why do we have no record of what they did? What they did? And uh, uh, you know, I understand the puzzle, but this is the answer that I hold to. And uh, I get a little teary eyed when I teary -eyed when I'm explain it, so you have to bear with me. Jesus doesn't do anything small. <laughs> and uh, this account, you know the account Jesus was raised. And uh, this is not the first time something like that has happened, where there's others that were raised. And it's in, uh, in 2 Kings, 2 Kings 13, and it's uh, verse 20 and 21 is the uh, account where Elisha is dead. He's been buried. And another man who's dead, but recently dead, is thrown near Elisha, and he comes to life. I believe that this, what we're seeing with Jesus, is a large echo of that very thing, is that where Jesus is raised, in the nearby tombs. It doesn't mean all the tombs in the county of Jerusalem. It means those tombs nearby. And it does not mean those who have been dead for years and centuries, but those who have recently died, like the man in 2 Kings. So these bodies of persons that have been recently died, people who don't know their names, that when Jesus is raised, the power of the resurrection raised to these other people, to life. It would be to mortal life, I hope, that they were raised like the man that was um, with Elisha, and uh, therefore, like Lazarus as well, they were raised not to eternal immortality, where they ascended the kingdom, but rather those raised up, sure, <coughs> that, uh, that is this better? Good, thank you. Sorry for the, the sound. Um, so I think that what, what happened there was not just some added story, but this was to draw out that our Lord is pointed to, all arrows are pointing to Jesus. And if you know the Old Testament, you, you find constant uh, echoes of the past uh, of prophets or other events pointing to Jesus. And so I'm, I'm very certain that the account occurred. I have no doubt in my mind. Yeah, but it answers some of the puzzles that it wasn't just all people uh, that have been dead for centuries, but those bodies in the nearby tombs where Jesus was raised at that, that location, that geography, those who had died because they were in the last week or so where their bodies had decayed to dust. But those things with people that were raised, they walked out and they would make themselves go, you know, you know me, I just was buried just a week ago. Well, I, you know, here he is, here these people have been raised. So anyway, um, I was asking Dami because of that uh, with Michael Kona. <coughs> why did he have to compromise and say that was not hard work? Okay. Do we have? Uh, yes, we do. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, so as an introduction, uh, introducing uh, myself first is that I'm Jay Hess. I was raised uh, as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, henceforth in the state of Jada. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jada. Um, and I was asked to leave when I was uh, 39 years old. Um, so I've been in it most of my life. Technically, I was in it for 23 years from baptism until I was being disfellowship. And uh, I was a, a loyal believer of Jada, but not everything, especially issues with the organization. And I was an independent thinker, and I plead guilty on that one. But I wanted it to be true. I wanted the watchtower to be true. And there was one doctrine that held me in by its clutches, and that is the reputation of the Trinity. I was sure of it. And I even wrote articles, and I did some self-publishing, um, trying to refute the, the Trinity. I even did a video, didn't get my distribution. A uh, video on refuting the Trinity. It's a seven-hour video. And because of that, <laughs> And the Watchtower got wind of it, and I was recruited to first be involved with the research department, then I got involved with the writing department, and they asked me to write a series of Watchtower study articles on refuting the Trinity because they thought that I was, I was pretty good at that. 
And uh, Sarah Alvacino asked me to uh, go over to a local seminary, do some reading up on the early church fathers. And it was the intent was to refute Robert Bowman's book, which was why you should believe in Trinity. <laughs> so that was the intent. The society was affected by uh, Robert Bowman's book and wanted me to respond to it. And they thought I'd be the one. So uh, wrote uh, a couple articles. And the second article that I submitted, which was on that Jesus should be worshipped, was I had become convinced that, the, that Jesus should be worshipped. And uh, in fact, at that time, which was in the late 1980s, that still was the Watchtower's policy. You could worship Jesus in a sense. And the Watchtower was transitioning from one position to another. And in March of 1990, they officially um, uh, said that Jesus was not to be worshipped. And I was caught right in the middle of that, saying here I was advocating Jesus to be worshipped. So uh, if you know anything about Jehovah's Witnesses, that's when they, they communed bring together a judicial committee, so in a sense I was arrested. I was charged with uh, uh, worshiping Jesus. I, I admitted it, I confessed, and I did not repent. So I was found guilty in this fellowship. And then uh, I appealed that decision saying it shouldn't have been a sin. So, you know, yes, I did it, but it shouldn't be a sin. So six weeks, I appealed to the governing body because having been a writer, uh, associated with the writing department, you get treated differently. So I got a, a judicial committee that was not your normal elders. I didn't even know these guys were. And then uh, they appealed the decision, <coughs> letter, sent it off to the governing body, came back and said, convene another uh, judicial committee. Another three guys I didn't know. And it was kind of a rubber stamp on the first one. I was declared wicked and out the door. So uh, that, was, that, was, that was it. And I have not come back. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody says, you ever want to go back? Yeah. After I, I'm laughing, with barely catching my breath, I said, are you kidding? I don't know, I'm very glad. But I was, I was disoriented. And the reason I was disoriented and I couldn't figure out where I fit was because of this doctrine that we're going to discuss, which is the, the Trinity. And it's because, and this is the honest truth, is that in all my going, uh, knocking on doors, going door to door, I used to go to door, door to door, in the seminary student housing for Southeastern Memphis Theological Seminary. <laughs> and that's where my territory was. I was a Jada going door to door out in SEDTS uh, seminaries, student housing. And so it was, it, to, to be fair, that was at the time when they were going through the revolution between the moderate and the conservative. So then they were the moderate and liberal. And uh, I remember to this day talking to seminary students, and I even got a professor once. And the Trinity was my favorite, obviously, because that was my area of expertise. The Trinity, refuting the Trinity was my number one choice. And the average uh, seminary student had, couldn't answer. And to be honest, I'm just telling you the way it is, uh, that um, uh, I had a lot of debates, and I never lost one. And there was a reason. And of course, it, it angers me now. Thank you, I'm not an angry person, but it upsets me now that I, no Christian said, could you come in? I'd love to explain to you the Trinity. If I'd known, you know, then what I know now, I would have begged some Christian somewhere, please, just say gently, kindly, come into my home and take a deep breath and let me explain to you the, the Trinity. But that never happened. That never happened. And I was winning the debates. And it shouldn't have. It should not have happened. So I'm going to go over today those points. There's five points, five issues that were big to me gaps of what Trinitarians should have said to me. And had I would have needed, you know, three out of five anyway to uh, become a embrace the Trinity. Because to be honest, that was the only doctrine. I was. I was. I could have been talked out of all the others. I, at that point, I actually dumped their doctrine from the spirit. I go, nah, hey, there is a spirit. And I, I dumped that. And I dumped a couple others privately. But I didn't dare share it. Because why? I was in a mindset that this was the channel of God. And I was being judged, not by my faith in Christ, but by my faith in an organization. And I had, you know, a little faith in it. Um, but I figured God is going to judge me. I've got to play my, i got to play the, the, the gambling game here and place my bets in the right place. So I was still thinking independently, but I had never met a group of believers that could explain the Bible to me. The Jehovah's Witnesses didn't do a great job, but they were doing better than the Southeast. That was the logic. 
So that is why, not because the watchdog had all the answers, but they had more answers on the important doctrines. So if a Christian wanted to debate with uh, birthdays or the cross, I was kind of leaning for a cross anyway. But that's not, if you don't know who Jesus is, what does it matter? So I, want, I needed, and I don't just say wanted, I needed a Christian to sit down and explain to me the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. I believe Jesus was my Savior. I, I, you know, I believed all that. And I knew it was not based on works, but I wanted the real Jesus, and I wasn't getting that. So there are five topics, five points, and we're going to consider that. And what I needed was an answer. Uh, oh, yes, a little bit more on the, uh, uh, so there is this article. <laughs> MCO and uh, downstairs, and it's uh, how many pages is that? Uh, seven, eight pages. Uh, and I'm not even going to, I can't within enough time, I'm going to cover the highlights of this, and I'm going to get to what I really want to talk about, which is about Adam and the Trinity, and a couple things that are not in this at all that we will uh, get to a little bit in this. And that is what I uh, finally had to come to with this understanding. So that, ah, uh, got it, I got it with, with the Trinity is, and that's, so that's in this article here. A little bit more about myself, so I got out of the Watchtower, uh, was baptized in the Southern Baptist Convention Church, uh, I joined ETS, the Evangelical Theological Society, been in that for it, 20 years now. Um, um, I get it that they've got some funny administrative things that they do, okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm there for it. Uh, I'm there for getting the information, and I, get all their published papers each year, which is about 550 of them, that they do at the conferences. I try to keep up on that. Uh, I'm also the senior, you might use the word pastor, we don't like titles, so I'm the senior elder at a small evangelical church in, in Garden, North Carolina. And we open every uh, sermon with uh, Jesus is Lord. And you know why? Because Romans 10, and Jesus is Lord, and what do Jehovah's Witnesses never say? Jesus is Lord. So I'm making up for lost time. So <laughs> Jesus is Lord to the congregation. Uh, so um, I've got a ministry uh, dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, but I'm kind of moved on. I'm still involved with Jehovah's Witnesses because I know that so much, but I moved on. I, I'm the disciple. I'm the director of disciple for the church. And as our goal, we disciple every regular attendant. We have a five-month course, and we disciple every regular attendant. So everyone's got to know uh, some fundamentals, the fundamentals of the Bible, and be a solid Christian before they become, uh, be able to um, offer free home studies where they come from. But I provide homemade pizza halfway through the class. <laughs> That's good pizza toast. Uh, so, uh, so the problem uh, with the uh, presentation of the Trinity, typically done in, in most uh, ministries, is that there's real gaps in the presentation. And as I was a, a Jada listening to the presentation of Christians talking to me, they would say things like, uh, well, there, there's but one God. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm with you there. Uh, God is one in three. Okay. That's English. It's in a sequence. But in my mind, it can get what you're even saying, whether it's true or false. I can't even evaluate whether it's true or false, because that means nothing to me. Uh, Jesus is not the Father, but he is God. Again, English, got it. But I don't know what that means. The words are, are not getting to me. I need something. Give me something. And if you're telling me this is essential to be right with God, and this is the Bible, um, Here's what will happen is that uh, it sounds like nonsense to me. And you see, as a witness, I knew that there was problems with the Watchtower. And there's some doctors, as I said, I'd already dumped a couple of them. I could live with some things saying the Watchtower is wrong. I understand it differently than the Watchtower does, but I do understand it, and I know why they're wrong. I got that, and I can live with issues that like, the church I go to, I don't agree with 100%. What I can't deal with is that in order to be right with God, I can adopt this doctrine that I can repeat with my mouth, and I don't know what it means. It doesn't, I don't get it. Um, 
I, I, I don't understand what that means. And it sounds contradictory and nonsense. I can't do that. I can't trade uh, <coughs> a, a, what I'm dealing with in my church with the Jehovah's Witnesses and say, okay, I disagree. I'm not going to trade that away with not what <coughs> nonsense and, and contradiction. I'm not going to do that. So uh, now I have a call-in show. Uh, every other week we do a call-in show for XJWs and Unitarians and those that are non-Trinitarians. So I, it's a, 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 a a phone call in show. And I get questions from people who aren't witnesses or never have been witnesses, but I do get questions too. But they're all about, um, uh, of course, I'm doing this discipling show, and for a while I, I do things on the Trinity. And it, the question that people want to know, besides what we're talking about, they want to understand the Trinity because I, they're not Trinitarians and I am. And they go, this, is, this sounds like nonsense to me. And it's the doctrine that I can't handle. I got a call from a, a one gentleman. It was one data who said, you know, I can navigate and compromise and change on the cross and birthdays and hell and, uh, you know, I can, I can move closer to the mainstream Christianity, but this doctrine of the Trinity sounds like nonsense. And that's my hurdle. And again, for me, that's what kept me as, as a witness because I'm going door to door and I can kind of see where Christians are coming from and I can even kind of see their point and I can live with it. But I said, all right, explain to me the Trinity. And I'd ask the one question, end of conversation, and I would say to God, I don't, this can't be true. Why would I leave, even though I've got a, an imperfect system that I have, why would I leave that for this, this view? So I need, I need better answers. And uh, it, it, to me, uh, it sounded like, it sounded like the Trinity was an invented doctrine, like the watchtower said it was pagan and that Christians were looking for data points in scriptures. A scripture here, a scripture here, a scripture here, to kind of fit this, this doctrine. That's kind of what it sounded like. And it was uh, a very, sounded very contrived. I needed something, I needed something better. And I'd say it's also not just the way it's anybody, because the Trinity, the way it's presented, communicated, sounds mystical, and it's mysterious at some point. So it, um, what to do differently. Uh, do I pull it down or do I pull the mic up or I don't know, we'll, we'll try that. And, but even non-believers, uh, because non-believers have got a different thing. They're not in, uh, even believers in God yet. And you're saying, well, there's a major doctrine you ought to believe that Jesus is the Father. He's not the Father, but he is God and this and that and the other. And what is a non-believer going to do? An atheist agnostic kind is going to go, Christianity is nutty. Um, Maybe I'm searching for something. Uh, I agree there ought to be something out there. But this, if this is a major doctrine, this is not even going to do this. So I'm saying that this is not just for J-Dubs and Mormons, but it's for anybody else. So I found five gaps in the explanation of the Trinity that I wish I begged for people to uh, address. And number one was, uh, we need a, a definition of the Trinity that's not uh, ambiguous, so it's unambiguous, but it's entirely tied to scripture. So let's get rid of the ambiguities in terms of the word God, uh, using it once as an individual or as a title or as a name, and then as a nature, as an ontology. Whoa, uh, don't do that to my head. You know, until I've had several years of seminary, then you can do that to my head. Um, so and it should be, again, each part of that definition tied to a scripture, at least one. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to, that's what this article is about. There's 25 verses. My choice, I thought, were some of the strongest and some of the best. But the definition is derived from those uh, verses. And so it, it makes it very nice. It would have worked for me. Oops. Second point. The uh, doctrine of the Trinity uh, should be plainly, that uh, you explained that it's plainly visible in Scripture. And it's found in Scripture in logical places. Uh, one, uh, a couple weeks ago, as I was doing this call and show, a guy called in and he says he was a Unitarian and anti Trinitarian, is what he, I think he said. Uh, he says, I got an issue. He says, You Trinitarians, you present the Trinity, and you got a couple of verses, maybe in the Old Testament, and you got a, a 
few of the New Testament you've got a picture of these in there. One in John, some of the writings of Paul, and the book of Hebrews, and you've got some of these verses we cobbled together, and this is this picture you get. And why would I think to find the Trinity in the book of Hebrews, which was not one of the earlier books written, it was one of the later books written. So it doesn't even seem to be, if it's so important, why is it not in the right place in Scripture? And I said, it is. And I, I took him through it, and at the end he goes, oh. All right, uh, we're going to do that. A little bit higher up. Higher. Okay, yeah. we'll try higher. It, uh, when I'm in church, we've got it in a right, right here. We, 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 our microphone comes out yeah. right by my mouth. So we're, okay, we'll try this. Point number three. This was this was a big issue for me as a, as a Jada. Uh, the idea that God is one. Okay. Now I'm a witness, thinking, ah, okay, one person is one God. And they go, no, no, no. Uh, sometimes God is a single person of the Father, and sometimes it's all three. Well, you know, the watchtower would say one plus one plus one is. Three for us, and the Trinitarians would say, "Well, and I saw I, Trinitarians would hand the head to me as I'm going to order to hand on these little little uh, little handouts tracks. They'd say one times one times one is one." And I said, "That sounds real cutesy, but <coughs> very clever. But where's the scripture that says that? Uh, if God is one and there's multiple persons, then I'm looking for something that." says that the oneness about God is preeminent over the threeness. So that I don't conclude that there's three gods, that I look at it and go, oh, of course, there's one. But not just because there's a verse that says God is one or something like that. I want something that ties this together, at, at least conceptually. Don't give me a, um, an illustration of water as liquid, solid, and gas. That's an illustration. That, again, what does that sound like? Contrived doctrine, and we're looking for an illustration to fit you know, the data points. Hmm, this is not working for me. I needed scripture that said that the preeminence of the oneness overrides <laughs> the two-ness or the threeness. Because as a JW, I didn't believe in the personality of the Holy Spirit. So I, I, I would have wanted you to start with at least the oneness pervades over the, the, the two-ness. And that wasn't, I didn't heard that. That was important. Number four, how can the term God refer both to a single individual, as you know, God does refer most often to the Father, and, and a nature? And God is a nature? How would I get that? Where would I get that? And, and how, how, what? Where does that come from? Can you show me a scripture that teaches that even that idea that a word can be both an individual and a nature? And then lastly, number five, how can the name or title be both a refer to a collective or you know, one, or a collection of one? That sounds pagan, or at least the watchtower is saying that sounds pagan. Give me something that's, that's biblical. Okay, moving. So here's the response to this. Uh, this is my uh, definition. As I said, we needed a definition that was not in a, no ambiguities and tied to Scripture. Every part of this definition is tied to Scripture. In the one Creator are three distinct testifiers. You notice I don't use the word person, and there's a reason for that. Three distinct <coughs> testifiers, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who each equally and uniquely possesses Godness. And I don't even use the word God in there, do I? I use Godness, which is what? A nature. Deity. Deity. And the deity, I thought about using deity, but you know, Hindus and deities and different kinds of ideas. I said, I want something new. I want to use a different word that ties the word God, but emphasizes it's the nature of God. And I didn't, I just, in my own vocabulary, deity didn't quite do it. So this is my definition. And each part of that, if you know your Bible really well, you've been in this ministry, you go, I get it. Each part of that definition I can tie to a scripture. And there's about 20 of them. I chose my favorite top 20. Part two of this definition is also important. <coughs> as, you, as you may know, within the evangelical community, there are two views 
There's the complementarian and egalitarian. And as I said, there you are, it's just making them aware that there is this difference within the evangelical community of scholars, that there's the two views, and you don't have to promote either one. I just ask that you make the witness or the person aware that there's the two views. I need to be honest and be fair. And this view is that from the complementarian, the Son and Holy Spirit are eternally subordinate in rank, in rank and role, to the Father, or who is the patriarch. Okay? So it's uh, not subordinate in nature, no. Uh, because the first part says that they should be the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all share God and it's equal. But uh, this says that the Son and the Holy Spirit are subordinate in rank in their role. In other words, the Father sends the Son and the Father sends the Holy Spirit. So that's the definition. And there's the, the scriptures. And each of those scriptures is tied to that that definition, any part of the definition is tied to those set of scriptures. It takes me about a little over an hour to go through all those and, and work them out, and we're not doing that today. And where is it worked out? In the article. Okay. In the NCO article. So, uh, every bit of that. So, when I, if I talk to a JW, I said, let me give you a definition, and you tell me which part of the definition you disagree. So, I read that definition off. I'm not using the word person, I'm not going to use the word God, and they may want to go off on something else. No, 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 no. First tell me, where in this definition do you have a disagreement? And they've got to chew on that. And I've even done this with uh, vegetarians who also do not hold that the Holy Spirit and personality, a person. And they, hmm, okay. Okay, where is the verse that says the Holy Spirit is a testifier distinct from the Father and Son? I said, let's well, Hebrews 10, 15. Okay, and they look it up, and sure enough, in Greek, that's what it says. So you can tie every bit of that to a scripture. <coughs> so uh, leave that for the article. Uh, point number two. Where is the doctrine of the Trinity visible? If I'm a non-believer, or if I'm a Unitarian or an Arian, which is what the Jacobs are, and I come to this book, if this doctrine is so important, the place of the Trinity should be in a prominent, logical place. Where do I find it? And there it is. Uh, the first part of this is the core doctrine is found in the first part of the Bible. And then you explain Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is Elohim, there, plural. And it's plural now. And the singular verb, create, uh, uh, to create uh, this construct of a plural noun and a singular verb. Normally the noun matches the verb. You can't get out of Genesis 1-1 without a Hebrew uh, anomaly. You get there and go, wait a minute. Now you can go through some mental gymnastics of why you have a plural noun and a singular verb, but you got to do that in your head. It jumps out at you. There was something odd going on here. Plural noun, singular verb, and what is the verb? It's create. And what was that definition? There is one creator. <coughs> and if you can create the universe, hmm, you're probably God. Because <laughs> you know, it's hard to follow that. Right? <laughs> so then you jump down to Genesis 1.26. And Elohim, by the way, says, let us see a man in our image. <coughs> and as the, the Trinitarians that I came across would always emphasize, see, it's us, you know, let us make man in power. Us and our, that's plural. And I'm going, okay, so where's the Trinity in that? And they kind of froze. The word image is singular. That is the Trinity, by the way. Plural persons who all share and have the same image. How is that not the Trinity? Again, it's not about some, some of the topic. It's plural persons, one image. And I wish the Trinitarian had said that. So it's multiple persons all sharing the same image. And then I, the Trinitarian would have said to me, and that's basically what the Trinity is. Do you <laughs> do not believe that the Son is a creator, he created, he made, and has the same image as his Father? And I think I would have choked, because I'd run through the scriptures in my head and go, wow, he does seem to share the image of his Father, and he did make the universe. Oh no, am I a Trinitarian? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that is the, the doctrine of the core. And I'd say, so if you're wondering where 
is the Trinity in a prominent place in the Bible? Let's see. Genesis chapter 1, the first verse in the chapter. That's pretty prominent. You can't start the book without it. Okay, that's that's where it starts out. Where, and that's the court, where is it wrapped up? Is there a place where it's kind of wrapped up in a significant place? Yes, it is. Look at Jesus' last speech. His last speech on the night of his, his last night of his life. And so I list the scriptures there. John chapters 13 through 17. And I've got there's several in John chapter 13, so a bunch in John chapter 14. John chapter 15, John chapter 16, John chapter 17. And I once was asked to do a sermon or a presentation that I kept about an hour and a half because I had to work each verse showing the deity of Christ, that the Son is a distinct person, and also the Holy Spirit. This is where you get the Holy Spirit. Uh, one thing that <coughs> I needed to hear you know, uh, explain to me, and, and John, uh, Jesus said, I will send another paraclete. Who was the first paraclete? No, I never heard anybody ask me, who's the first paraclete? According to this, Jesus is the first paraclete. If you go to 1 John 2, 1, Jesus is the first paraclete. And then Jesus says, oh, I'm going to go away, and the Father's going to send another paraclete. How many is that? Okay, there's one paraclete, another paraclete. Are they distinct? Uh-huh. Um, the illustration I use is if I'm on... I got a plumber working on the house, got some important plumbing work to do. And he comes up and he says, Oh, boss man. He says, um, I gotta run, I'm looking at my watch, I gotta run. Uh, I'm gonna send another plumber. Okay, he goes. A little bit later, a FedEx truck pulls up, the guy comes up the door, he says, hands me a box with a wrench in it. <laughs> That's not what I'm expecting. I'm not expecting a tool. I expect what? Another plumber. Maybe look a little bit different, but he's got the tools, he's got the tool belt, and he's ready to go, and he can do the same kind of job the first guy can do. That's what I'm expecting. Well, Jesus said, I'm going to send another paraclete. He's, Jesus is number one, now there's number two. I said, that is the doctrine of the Trinity. And if you expand a little bit to John, in John chapter 10, verse 30, my father and I are one, in John 1, 1. So we're going to talk about John 1, 1 a little bit today. This is... The doctor of the Trinity, in John chapter 16, Jesus says the Father will give everything to the Son, the Son will give everything to the Holy Spirit. Now, if the Holy Spirit is not distinct, where did it go? Did it go, did the Father gives it to Jesus and Jesus gives it to himself? Well, that's odd. Or the Father gives it to Jesus and Jesus gives it back? That's why. It, rather, the Father goes to the Son, the Son goes to the Spirit, the Son gives it to the congregation, the Spirit gives it to the congregation. Very simple. Distinct, and yet they are all God. Because they all share the same nature, and this is all starting to come together. That's what I needed to hear from the Trinitarian, so that's what I gave to the Stella on the phone. I says two prominent places, Genesis chapter 1 and the last night of Jesus' death. I mean, where else would Jesus give it? This, he's leaving us, so he's got to write it down. He's got to give a really full speech that you all got to hear. And when he does it, what does he do it? On his last night. Right place to give it. And then, as I said, the fellow the after Trinitarian chair said, oh, man, what are you going to do? So that was what I needed to hear as a uh, uh, an alien. Number three, I needed to hear, and this is where we get into the, the title of the talk, that the Adam and Eve and the Trinity, this is what I really, really, really needed to hear, is that if God is one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that that oneness overrides the threeness. So that when someone says, but they're really not three gods, they're one God, I'm trying to follow that along. You know, I don't get that. And then the illustration of the water, you know, the, the liquid, gas, and solid. Okay, that's a fine illustration. It sounds like you've admitted the doctrine and you're looking for something to make it work. So give me a, a scripture, and it's got to be a scripture. And that scripture's got to do that. It's got to override the uh, two-ness or three-ness of the person. So that if I do one plus one, the answer is one. I need a scripture that says one plus one is one. Is there one? If you know my, you know this presentation occurred before, then you guess the answer is there is. So we're going to start by looking at Genesis. Uh, Genesis 2.24, we know that the man and wife have become one flesh. Genesis 5, 1 through 2, I'll, I'll read it. Um, we'll, we'll put it in. 
uh, because this is really what the, what the presentation is about. Genesis 5, 1 and 2. So we know that the two shall become one flesh. Genesis 5, 1 and 2 says this. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day when God, Elohim, created man. Who did he create? Yeah. Man. Okay. He made him, him, him refers to Adam, okay, a single man, right, <coughs> one guy, okay. he made him in the likeness of God. So who are we talking about here? One or more persons, how many? Right here, one, named him, that's one, it's singular. Verse two, he created them. What? We went from created him, which is one, to them, which is two. He made them male and female, two, right? right. Mm -hmm. Male and female. And he blessed them, there it is, them, again, and named them, okay, here we name them, but Mr. and Mrs. That's not what it says. He named them man in the day they were created. Named them man. Well, wait a minute. This is messing with my mind. The first part said he made him man, named him man. He left one guy. Now I have two, and two are named man. Oh, the first man is an individual. The second man is a nature. The first man is an individual. The second occurrence of man is a nature. Whoa. Okay, this is this is beginning to work because because I can I picture Adam and Eve. I can. I can wrap my mind around that. And there's man and woman. Is the woman, is she man? Yeah, because she's human. She's not bovine. She's not feline. Right? She's not a bird. She's not a fish. She's made from the side of Adam. So genetically, she is man in nature. Is she a man? Wouldn't have worked for Adam at all. Was she the man? Whoa! <coughs> How many are in the garden? How many people think they're in the garden? You know, uh, we need therapy. Because there's two people, but there's a male and a female. All right. So that, that gives us 5.2. Now I need a scripture that takes Adam and Eve and puts us together and, and, and gives me this arithmetic. One plus one is one. Mark 10, 8 is what did it. And we're going to read the context. The context is so wonderful. Uh, I like the Mark 10. I don't know why. Matthew 19 is equivalent to it. In Matthew 19, 46. But I like my Mark 10. Verse 8. I don't know. Mark 10. But we read the context of 6 to 9. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. <coughs> we're still talking about Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve. For, the reason, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. One plus one. So they are no longer two. two. That's Jesus' words. Is, yeah, they are no longer two. Okay, I'm trying to work with you, Jesus. One plus one is, and then Jesus says, no longer two. So one plus one is one. Where's that scripture I've been looking for? Here, Adam and Eve, one plus one, they're no longer two, but one flesh. And I'm going, I'm getting this. I can picture Adam and Eve, and which is more prominent? What is God asking us? They're now one flesh. They were singles, now they're married. How does God want us to understand this couple? They are one. And when God is brought together, they're not to what? Separate. Verse 9, but therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. What does separate mean? You're focusing on the two. God is saying, this has got to stop. You're thinking of them two. This has got to stop. One plus one is now one. And so when I present this to a Jacob, I says, don't argue with me. This is Jesus' arithmetic. <laughs> it's not your arithmetic. This is Jesus' arithmetic. One plus one is one. Don't get mad at me. It's right there in the text. Yeah. And they're working at the first year the jade of mind is going other directions. I said, no, no, stick with the definition. Mm -hmm. And just, just 
God wants us to see this couple as one. I get it that there's two persons. If I'm standing in the garden, how many do I see? I'm thinking I see them too. But God is saying, oh, you've got to see them as a single thing. The single thing overrides the two-ness. That's what I needed to make this mental jump, is that the singleness overrides the two-ness of them. So what is it that was two that's now one? It's our relationship. Relationship to uh, these, these two persons. So uh, the story I tell is that uh, when my son got engaged, prior to all that, I could call my son and say, hey, let's hang out, let's do something. And he didn't have to check with anybody. Okay? <laughs> After he's married, you know, that phone line was dead. I, mean, I couldn't just call him up and say, hey, let's hang out. Because there was another person before there were two relationships. After they're married, that's all done. Now I relate to a single thing. And I might see my son and his wife as two individuals, but that thinking has got to stop. I stop thinking that they are two. I now see them, they're not one person. So that's a question. So if they're no longer two, is God saying they're no longer two persons? Oh no, they are still two persons, but your thinking, because how you relate to them in a social <laughs> way has changed. So this is now the illustration I use, is that when I relate to God, we are asked not to relate to God as if we were three gods. That is not happening. You are to relate to God as a single relationship. This is God. And, and that relationship overrides any other thinking about whether well, it might be two or three. No, no, no. Because of this purpose. Now, I was sharing this with the uh, modalist. As, as I was leading into this, it's the scripture that says all this that you just said. This is an illustration. That's pretty good. But where is the scripture that says it? Well, first of all, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the man. And man is the head of the woman. There we are. Back again. Adam and Eve. Man and the woman. That relationship. God draws on that relationship. Paul draws on it to explain God. Father, God, the head over Jesus. Jesus is the head of the man, man is the head of the boy. So there's a parallel there. It's not real strong just yet, but we're, we're going to get there. Okay. As I said, we're going to get there. So I want to uh, put this together. Number four, how can God refer to both a single individual and a nature? Remember that was the nation. How can it be a single individual and a nature? So let's take what we just learned and read it and apply it to John 1 1. First, before we go to John 1 1, let's summarize what we've learned about the man or woman, Adam and Eve, in the garden. In the garden, the woman, right? In the garden with the woman, the woman was with the man, and the woman was man. Was she a man? Oh no. Was she the man? No way. So the only thing that works in that sentence is that the woman was man where man is now a nature, an ontology. While the first occurrence of man, the woman was with the man. That's another individual. And she's with this other man. Got that. I can picture that. That's not part. The woman was with the man. Sure, got it. And then the second part, I was to think, yeah, woman was man. Yes, because of Genesis 5, 1 and 2, she was man. And then it hits you, is that that's like John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the word was, the word was with God, the word was God. Could this read the word was a God? No. Same reason as if the woman is not a man. That is the Could it read that the word was the God? Is that what Trinitarians mean? Oh no. We don't mean the word was the God. We mean the word was God. This God, <coughs> the phrase, is a nature, an ontology. That's the big long word that means nature. The first occurrence of the word God in John 1 1 is an individual. The word was with God. That's a person. Then the rest of the phrase, the word was, the word was with God, and the word was God, that's a nature. And you're saying, that sounds odd that, it did, that the word God could be both a person and a nature in the same verse. <coughs> Genesis 5, 1 and 2, the same thing happens. Man, in the first part of it, is a person, and then the second part of it, man is the nature of God. Okay? That's, uh, <coughs> I needed some. I needed an understanding of John one. That's that was it. 
So how can a name be both a collection and not just many, but one single thing? This is where my friend, who is now a Trinitarian, by the way, who was a modalist, asked that question. He says, where's the scripture that says all this? John 17. John 17. That was the last night of his life. Jesus gives the answer. And this is the high priest of prayer, uh, verses 11 through uh, verse 11 and 20 through 23 is the answer, I believe, works for me. John 17, 11 says, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you've given me, that they may be one, <coughs> even as we are. So the oneness is, he says, that they may be one, even as we are. So that tells you that answer. This is the verse, or the first verse that tells us what that relationship is. How are they one? Someone says, well, how are the Father and one? John 17, last night of his life, he answers that very question. Let's jump down to verses 20 through 23. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, these men, these disciples, but for those who all who believe in me through them, through their word. Who's that talking about? Us. Yes, Christians, us. It says that they may all be one, Oh, okay. So all these disciples are going to be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. Are the Father and Son close? <laughs> like you would not believe, or you would not conceive, because this is how close they are. Does that sound like an angel? No, because even the last star says that Jehovah God is far above the angels. That's not the picture I get uh, it says that uh, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So he is praying that there'll be a day when in perfection we will be in the Father and the Son, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Uh, <coughs> and even in there, we have the Father and <coughs> the Son. There is a sent relationship. Are they distinct? Yes. Is there a different in role? Yes, there is. And in verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they be one just as we are one. So there is, there is that oneness. <coughs> verse 23, I have given them you and me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me even as you have loved me. So there is, uh, this is a prayer for a future event as we're still imperfect. Are we one here? Well, are we one in nature? Everybody's here is human, right? Amen. We're all human. And imperfect humans. <coughs> but in perfection, you see what Jesus was praying for. A unity that he said, we're going to be, he's, yeah, he all, Jesus already knew, of course, the, the oneness with his father and the disciples were learning this. And then now the disciples are hearing, we're going to be one someday, like the father and the son are one. Oh, I got to sit and think about that for a while. That is awesome. That is awesome. But this is what he was praying about. But in the process, it explains to us how the Father and Son are one. Is this paganism? No, this is not paganism. This is what this is what we mean when we say the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit are one. There's a unity that's beyond what we can comprehend right now, but at least we will we get what's going on. So, um, yeah, as, as the little, this paragraph says, the body of testifiers, that's these disciples, all <coughs> of them, also the, not only the disciples are going to be united, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are also testifiers, <coughs> are united. But when it speaks of the disciples, they're not united with God in ontology. And even amongst the believers, there's, we're, yeah, we're all human, but is that the unity that Jesus is only, is he stopping about, well, my disciples are all human? He's referring to more than just the disciples are human, right? It's more than that. So that was the point I needed to hear from the Trinitarians, is that, yes, they're united in ontology, but it's more than that. I needed to hear those words that said it is also a oneness in the community a social oneness, a oneness of relationship. 
And now we see why we talk about the family. There is a oneness of the relationship, and it's so, it's so strong, it's stronger than the person thing. The relationship that, that they have, it's a relationship. And it's so important that it even happens here in John 17, that we're united in that relationship. It's not just ontology nature, it's also a social unity. And it is more prominent than the individuality of the individual testifiers. So then I move on for, uh, to, to um, amplify this. I said 4310. A little irony there because of the <laughs> yeah. A little irony because this is the, the number one verse for the Jehovah's Witnesses. This is where they get the name. And if you read that carefully, it says, You are my witnesses. Testifiers, see, there's that word again, testifiers. So why is this so important in the Bible? Testifier was a Jewish legal term, which was in a court, uh, you had to have more than one testifier, okay? And if I got up and I said, yeah, Billy Bob did it, and then I sit down, and then I get up and I put a sock in my hand, and yes, Billy Bob did it. <laughs> the sock puppet doesn't count. <laughs> It's got to be a separate testifier. So testifier is very important. You've got to have many of them to make it true. So here I say 4310, what God is saying? You are my testifiers. I can't have just one. One isn't enough. So is there one? God is saying absolutely not there isn't one. There must be plurality. And then in the next breath, he says, my servant. Singular. It's got to be single, too. That's God's intent, that they are united. Yeah, they're all human, that's true, but it's more than nature, than more than nature. it is there is a relationship. God relates to his people, and the people relate back to God. They, these people are a single unit, that's what they're supposed to be. Rather than diverse, oh, we're, we're a million individuals all wanting to testify about God and also serve God. God is born. No, no. I want you to all serve me in the United Faith. In other fashion, in other <clears throat> so that shows you the relationship from God to the people. Well, as a Trinitarian, I'm claiming the reverse words. There's three persons, and I'm relating to those three persons, and the relationship overrides the personhood. So I only see one God. Same as I see how many of them. You say how many? How many are there? I only see one. Jesus arithmetic one. So that people one. So that carries over here, and what do I get? That uh, <laughs> this oneness is very prominent. The relationship <clears throat> is not about ontology or nature alone. And this, this is Isaiah 43 10. What group of people was God saying this to? Jews. Jews. We would call them Israel. Wait, isn't Israel a name of a God? <laughs> it's also the name of a community. Whoa! So is there a name? that is both a collection and it refers to a single one. Yes, the patriarch. Let's see, what's the synonym of patriarch? Father. So, Jones Lucas would say, why is God called Father? Let's say this generates a son. I think, that, well, let's try the word patriarch here. Patriarch, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, that puts a religious <coughs> lamp on it, doesn't it? So I can refer to the patriarch as God, just as I can refer to the patriarch of Israel, Israel, his name was Israel. I can refer to him or Jacob, that works. Or, for all you know, I might be referring to the whole nation, a collection, a number of individuals. How do you know? <coughs> Unless you're following the context. You may not know when I say Israel did this. Because according to Isaiah 4310, could Israel, a collection, act as a single unit? Yeah, the servant, that singular. So I could say Israel is my servant, and you don't know what I'm talking about. I could be talking about a single individual, or I could be talking about a collection. And that's absolutely biblical. It's not painful. So that's what I needed to hear when I could go, I get it. God, the term God can refer to a single individual, the Father, as often happens in the New Testament, or it could refer to a collection. Three persons joined in a relationship that I have to relate to as a single thing. They all share the nature of godness equally. There's no difference in their uh, godness. And as you saw in the definition, they exclusively or uniquely 
Is there anybody else who has godness? Nope. No other maker of the universe. So we have four. But uh, there are three who made the universe. But the Bible commands me to speak of how many creators? One. One. What do I do? There's the scripture. And as a person who already knew some of the Bible, this makes sense. And it can make sense to an, an agnostic. They say, I don't get this. One says, can you understand a husband and wife that they are considered one unit? I know in our culture, units come and go. But <laughs> what is it meant to be? What really works well is a single unit. And I think an atheist, I would go and say, yeah, you're right. I can picture that. That one unit that's not intended to be separated, that's not their hold when they get married, is to stay married. Okay, I get that. And God adds another person, but they're united. I get that. And you say, that's, that's what the doctrine is. <coughs> So we've seen um, uh, the terms man and Israel were both used where it might refer, in fact, in the same context in, in Genesis 5, one, 2, man referred in one case a single individual, and in the next case a nature, and it can refer to the collection of all, because God named them man. Uh, Adam named them man. So putting this together, uh, God can be used in Scripture in these three ways. A single person the patriarch, the father, who sends the other two persons. I needed to hear that as a, as a Jada because most of the time in the New Testament, the term God does refer to a single individual. And I need that to be explained without a lot of handling. Uh, two, God can refer to a collection of persons sharing the same nature. And three, <clears throat> it can refer to the nature itself that is shared amongst these three persons. That's what I needed to hear. Now we've got. Can I have seven, up, seven more minutes? <laughs> All right. I wanted to throw in this, this, in, this is in the article. This was the question that stumped me. Well, as a Jada convinced me that Jehovah's Witnesses had the truth. That, uh, because I, I know God is all knowing. But what about Matthew 24, 31, 32, that no one knows the dare of except the Father? Neither the Son nor the angels, but only the Father. And I know. If someone says, oh, there's another answer, I know this. It, 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 historically, there's the answer that has to do with Jesus' dual nature. I got that. What didn't work for me is I accept, I could accept the dual nature. Sure, I got that. That was one of the things that I, I did early on down the Watchtower's doctrine about the resurrection. I believe in the physical resurrection. But the Bible clearly participated in the resurrection. There's no other way to take the text. I didn't tell any other J does that. I didn't know why. But, uh, <laughs> If I'm going to be kicked out, I'm going to be kicked out for worshiping Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's what I want. So I, I, could pull, I could handle the dual nature, but I didn't see the connection between, okay, the dual nature, why would that mean he can't know something that the Father does? Where's the connection? Where's the verse that says, because he has a dual nature, he can't know something the Father does? I didn't make that connection. I was looking for something else. And I don't know why this answer isn't in print, but if you do a search on the Greek, of uh, Mark 13, 32, or Matthew 24, 36, you find the exact same Greek phrase two other places. Uh, okay, this is in the UBS text, the eclectic text. Uh, not in the Textus Receptus, there is, there is uh, one in Revelation a little bit different. But if you even the, the Byzantine text, the majority text, the same Greek phrase, the same Greek words, the same order, no one knows except. That phrase is found in two other places, Revelation 2.17 and Revelation 19, 12 and 13, where it says that uh, Jesus gives this man, uh, what is it, uh, uh, a name written, and he, only he knows. Let me get the text, Revelation 2.17. <coughs> Revelation 2.17. So the name is written. Right. So no man knows. Uh, it says, to him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden man, and I will give him a white stone and, on, and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows, but he who receives it. Same Greek phrase. Does it mean that, the, since Jesus is giving it, that no one knows, not even the Father knows? Well, that sounds odd. <clears throat> Unless the word for no, which is the same word that Matthew and Mark 13 very good, unless that word no in such circumstances does not simply refer to data awareness, simple knowledge, just awareness, because others know it. No, 
<coughs> something deeper on a more personal level. And my illustration is, does the Father know from experience what it is to be like on the cross? If you're a Trinitarian, the answer is no. The Father did not experience the cross. But is the Father aware of the cross? Yes, of course. So it's the, the, the meaning in this context, or this type of context where it says no one knows but, is more than just data awareness, but is a deeper awareness. So in that case, how is it, going with this, going from what Revelation, how Revelation uses that phrase, we take that, transport that back to Matthew Mark, when Jesus said no one knows but the Father alone, what is it that's different about the Father than the Son regarding this event, the end of the, the age, when Jesus is to come? What's, what's the difference? Is there a scripture that answers and tells me the difference? Yes, Acts 1, 6, and 7. Let's see the difference there. Let's go to Acts 1, 6, and 7. Acts 1, 6, and 7. Jesus is uh, already resurrected, meeting with his disciples. And it says this. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? See? Same event. <coughs> he said to them, It is not for you to know times of action which the Father has fixed by his own authority. The Father has his jurisdiction of making the final decision. Why? Because he's the Father. He's the patriarch. How about that? He decides when things are going to happen. Does that mean the Son is not aware of it? No. It means that he does not decide it. Which is, as you see, the same as in Revelation. It's, that's that phrase. No, he alone knows. No one knows what that is. It's in an experiential way. So the Father decides it according to Acts. So the, I think what I believe is Matthew and Mark, maybe if you want to go with the dual nature, that's fine. But as a Jada, that did not work. But we as a Jada would joke around with each other and say, okay, I understand the dual nature. We can actually do that. We say, yeah, I can see the dual nature. But why? Does that slow down his brain or something? Why, how, why does he not know? And there was no answer from the Trinitarian view. that here's a scripture that says, because he has a dual nature, he can't know something. I don't know the scripture that says that. However, this argument explains how it is that the son doesn't know something because he doesn't decide it. He's made aware of it, but he does not decide it. And he's making that clear. So the father, he's the one that has the jurisdiction. He decides it. He, he sculpts it. He scripts it. He decides. He makes it happen. He tells me and I do let it go. It's a relationship. They're different. They're distinct persons. And if someone had said that, I would have gone, set me free. <laughs> because I was, I was so unhappy from time to time with what the Watchtower was doing. And if someone had just done that, and just given me the explanation. So it's, it's kind of a, a plea, uh, I beg of you to, uh, uh, this is being recorded, and uh, pick up these points. And much of it, not all of it, is in this article. Most of it is here. Uh, the part about where you find the Trinity in Genesis and then John chapter 17, that's not there. But the rest of it is pretty much in there. I would beg of you to use that because I, as a witness, even though I was in the business of refuting the Trinity, I would have just started looking at you with my jaw open. Wow, this works biblically. And I would have walked out of the watchtower and I would have joined you with the same songs. Um, different than the wax stars thing that sing the song of praise of Jesus. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions? We have, I don't think we have any questions.